Very good. We are now going to have the uh, lecture um, about uh, uh, Grice and the principle of cooperation. Um, so I am now going to share. Um, I'm going to share the PowerPoint. There it is. All right. So let me make this big so we can actually see it properly. All right. So first of all, um, this is a really important uh, uh, topic, and you will see. Um, you know, when you read, uh, there is a um, chapter of the uh, of the book, draft of the chapter of the book, available uh, on the LMS, uh, and it's called it's called uh, cleverly it's called Chapter Four Cooperation. So. Um, all right, so. Um, as you read that, uh, we're going to be talking about Grice's article, Logic and, or, and Conversation, which I suggest that probably would be a good idea to read it. Um, it's very easy to find. Just Google for it, and, and you'll, you'll be able to download it for free. Um, there is a summary of it that's uh, at that link that I, that I gave you. And if you want to go deeper, but and I'm, when I say deeper, I really mean significantly deeper. It's pretty intense. Uh, there is that uh, the Stanford um, um, Philosophy Encyclopedia that has a very, very good entry, very, very profound on uh, Grice's thought seen as a system. Um, not for the faint of heart. Okay, let me let me be very, very clear about that. All right. So, what is the fuss about? Uh, you know, I, I've said. This, uh, this idea, the, the, the idea of the principle of cooperation, has been extremely successful, okay? Um, we're talking about um, tens of thousands of citations of, uh, uh, you know, um, an enormous literature that has been born. And by and large, every single linguist or philosopher that works on, on issues that have to do with language and, and that kind of stuff, um, you know, communication, agrees that something along the lines of what Grice says is correct. Then the question becomes, you know, let's be more specific than that, and then you start having criticism and discussion. But pretty much everybody agrees on the general idea, okay? And that is quite an impressive uh, feat. So what is this general idea? General idea is that um, <clears throat> when you are um, talking to someone, right, in a conversation type situation, um, you should contribute to the conversation um, in a very specific way. And, and that's what he says here, um, as required by the accepted purpose of the talk exchange in which you're engaged. Okay, so, and that's a very complicated formulation. It's not clear, um, but, but once you understand exactly what he's saying, it actually becomes fairly clear. And, you know, so I've paraphrased it uh, there to, to make it uh, clear. Uh, so in other words, if you are having a conversation and you want to achieve a certain goal with that conversation, whatever your goal might be, right? The best way to do it is to talk in the direction of what the conversation expects. In other words, don't buck the the situation right just go with the flow of, of what the situation is right now um again this may not still appear not entirely uh, clear but here uh, these four rules uh, which um, grice calls maxims uh following Kant. it's an inside uh, a joke Kant had nothing to say about this but uh, um you know um the, he had four big big principles and so so Grice says me too and um, so basically he said okay so assume that you're having a conversation if somebody asks you something for example answer to the point speak to the point okay don't start talking about something else if you do that it's not going to go well right people are going to misunderstand you and they're not going to understand what you're trying to do 
that, that sort of thing. Same thing, tell the truth. Um, you know, the example that I always use is suppose that I walk into a coffee house or a donut shop and I say, can I have a cup of coffee? But I really want tea, right? So I want tea, but instead of telling the truth, I lie and I say, I would like coffee. Will I be happy at the end of this exchange? No, because I'll get tea, I'll get coffee rather, and I want the tea, right? Okay, or, or you know, if you say, I, I, I want to buy a donut, you walk into a donut shop and you say, can I have a cinnamon roll? That's not going to well, go well for you who wanted to eat the donut, right? So, so lying in that situation is just stupid, right? It doesn't get you what you want. Now, of course, in other situations, lying is the clever thing to do, okay? But that's different. This is fall under and you're wrong, and you say nothing. I'm fine. <laughs> exactly. That that is a completely different situation that we'll talk about. That's the advanced part of the of the principle of cooperation. Um, how to talk to your husband? It's, it's, a, it's a special. It's a separate course. It's a PhD level course. That uh, that um, yeah. Um, ironically, I've actually written about this. Subject, but, um, uh, okay. So then then the the next thing is. Again, you're in a conversation, say enough, not too much, not too little. If you say too little, you know, suppose that you're in a coffee house, there's 20 kinds of coffee, and you say, can I have a cup of coffee? And they're going to say, which one, right? We've got you know, 20 kinds, right? Or if you go to have ice cream, you say, can I have ice cream? Yeah, what kind, right? I mean, you're, you're not giving me enough information. You know, or if I say, you know, come over for dinner. And you say, well, where do you live? Oh, you know, near Lone Oak. <laughs> right, I mean, that's not enough information to find my house, right? I mean, okay. Now, on the other hand, saying too much is also confusing um, because then you start to look for meaningfulness in what you're hearing, right? So, so suppose that, um, you know, I said to you, come, come to my house, I, I live near Lone Oak, and... Uh, I started giving you like an extremely detailed description of the, the road that I live on, the street that I live on, and the neighbors. And you'd be like, what's going on here, right? Why is he telling me about the neighbors? Maybe he doesn't really want me to come over because he's now telling me that there's a crazy neighbor with the dog that barks all the time. And, you know, so I'm making this up. Right now. Uh, all right, okay. So, so saying too much um, is, is, again, um, or, or suppose that, you know, you ask uh, your husband to take uh, something to the dry cleaning, right? If you say, can you take something to the dry cleaning? Okay, I'm assuming you want me to go to the dry cleaning. But if you say, now I have this dress here that needs to go to the dry cleaner. Now, mind you, I mean the, the dry cleaner that we usually go to on, uh, you know, uh, Wesley Avenue in Greenville. And, uh, you know, now be sure that when you leave it, you know, it's like, okay, wait a second. Why too much, why this much detail, right? Why am I getting all this information? I've been to the dry cleaner a thousand times before, right? So if you're giving me all this extra information, there's gonna be a reason for the information to be there, right? And I can't figure out what the reason might be, yeah? Uh, and then the maximum manner is, is self-explanatory, you know, be clear, be orderly, be idiomatic, right? Speak speak in a way that is expected, right? Uh, you know, if I say, you know, I uh, bought ice cream, uh, no, I, I bought carrots and, and then I went to the store, right? You're like, wait, that's weird, right? First you go to the store, then you buy the carrots, right? Why are you telling it to me in a different way, right? Again, we try to interpret mm -hmm. this fact, right? So that's the principle of cooperation in the form of the maxim. Okay. Now here there has been a um, confusion uh, about the relationship between the principle uh, of cooperation and the maxims uh, uh, themselves. Okay. Um, so um, while there is general agreement, and uh, you know here I've given you Rice himself, and then a bunch of authorities on the subject that say very clearly that. The principle is the general idea, and the maxims are just instances. There are concrete, uh, you know, um, happenings of the principle, right? So you've got the principle, 
is your guiding light. And then you have specific cases of the principle that are the maxims. Some people have misunderstood uh, this, despite, as I say, the fact that it's very clear what, what Rice meant and what everybody uh, you know, agrees. Some people have misunderstood this, and they think that somehow you can violate a maxim, but be in abeyance of the principle, right? But that doesn't make any sense, okay? Because think about it for a second. Let's say that um, I have a principle, which is do no harm, right? That's, that's a reasonable principle, right? Especially if you look like a doctor, right? And then it says, okay, so that's your principle. And then you have a maxim, do not uh, kill people, do not cut off people's limbs for no reason, do not uh, stab them for no reason, don't remove organs randomly, right? Okay, these are all, you know, things that follow, fall under do no harm, right? Now, let's say that I said to you, you know, bummer, yesterday I got distracted and I took off somebody's lungs by mistake. But I was really not doing harm. See, it makes no sense, right? I mean, you know, you cannot say, well, but I didn't kill them. I just removed one of their lungs. Well, you still did harm, right? I mean, the fact that you didn't kill them or you didn't stab them, good for you. I'm saying that's a good thing, right? You know, generally speaking, you know, but you still did harm because removing a, a, an organ is doing harm, right? So there is no way that you can remove an organ, but I was still following the general principle of doing no harm, right? So the same thing is true here with the maxim. You cannot violate a maxim, but still be following the principle of cooperation. You're violating. If, if, you, if you violate one of the maxims, you violate the principle, period. Okay, so that's a, a confusion that you will find often in the literature, uh, people who, who say this. <coughs> uh, yeah, so here you have a well, different example, but it's the same idea. Don't commit crimes, don't steal, don't kill, etc. Right, so, so um, um, yeah. now we've spoken of violating uh, the maxims, right? Uh, but it's not the only case in which you don't observe the maxim. There's other um, failures to observe the maxim that you can that you can do. So, so we said violation is just when you just don't follow it, right? So, if I if I'm supposed to tell the truth, and you say to me, you know, did you eat any popcorn before? I say no, absolutely not. Right. But we know it's a lie because you saw me eating popcorn right here. <laughs> Just, just so people can see I'm eating pop. So I was lying. So that was a lie. I violated the principle of cooperation. By the way, never eat popcorn while you're giving a lecture. That is a valid uh, bit of advice for anybody who's going to be teaching out there. You can opt out from, from following. Um, and that is when, when you say something like, you know, so for example, um, you know, let's say that you ask me, um, where's the office of uh, institutional, the, the institutional review board office, where, where is it? And I say, well, I don't quite know, which is true. I, I actually don't know where it is. Yeah. Um, so, so what I'm saying is, look, I could guess, you know, but I don't have enough evidence to make a guess. So I'm gonna to, I'm gonna have to withdraw from the communication because I don't have enough knowledge to give you an, a valid answer about this. So I'm opting out of cooperating. Um, another situation is when you have a clash between two maxims. Okay, and again you're gonna opt out as, as a result of that. Okay, so here would be an example would be, uh, you know, you ask me. Are, are, you know, Bob and Mary having an affair? And I said, well, on the one hand, I've seen them walking, you know, hand in hand, but that's not proof that they're having an affair, right? I mean, you know, they could just be friendly, right? So, so here I have a clash. On the one hand, relevance enjoins me to tell you, yes, they're having an affair because I saw them walking hand in hand. But quantity says, Wait a second, only provide the information that is 
enough information to make a claim, right? That you have to be able to justify your claim. Do I have enough evidence that I'm having an affair? No, I don't, right? So this is the clash between the two maxims. And so you might say, look, I saw them walking, you know, hand in hand, but I don't know that that means anything. Okay, so so that's the the, the clash, and these are interesting, and, and plenty has been written about these. And there's a whole, um, um, you know, I've done actually some research on violations and so on and so forth. But the interest, the most important one, the most interesting one is flouting. Okay, now flouting is slightly more complicated because it works this way. Um, you do not follow a maxim, but you do so blatantly, openly, okay? Um, and so as a result, I cause you by, by openly violating the maxim, I cause you to start looking for a, a reason for doing so, okay? So let me, let me give you an example. Suppose that um, you say to me, you, you know that class starts at five. Right? So you, you come in and you say, what time is it? Mm -hmm. Okay? And I say to you, class hasn't started. Right? Now, on the face of it, I just refuse to answer your question. Right? Your question was, what time is it? Right? So I should have said 4.38, 5.15, you know, midnight, whatever. Right? I mean, I should have, the answer should have been a time. Right? Instead, so instead of answering with a time or saying, I don't know, because I don't have a watch, right? These would have been relevant answers. Instead, here I am talking about class, right? So it's a blatant violation, right? Because if I wanted to lie to you, let's say that I'm for secret reasons that we don't know what they are, I want you not to know the time, right? So what would I have done? I would have said, it's 2.50. And you go, oh, all right, okay, great. I'll come back later. Right? Okay, so right, but but instead, I you know, and then you would have never known that I violated the principle of cooperation, right? You would say, oh, it's it's too big, blah blah blah, walk away, right? Because you would have never guessed because it wasn't obvious, right? Um, now, however, here I say something that obviously shows that I'm not following the principle of cooperation. Mm -hmm. So at this point, you reason. Why is he saying something that obviously isn't following the principle of cooperation, right? Because if he had wanted to hide it, he would have not made it obvious. But here it's obvious. Anyone can see that he's not following the principle of cooperation. Therefore, he must have a reason for not following the principle of cooperation. What might that reason be, right? Well, here you reason and you say, I know that class starts at five. Mm -hmm. By telling me that class hasn't started yet, it means that the time isn't quite five, right? And because he's assuming that the reason that I'm asking the question is to know whether class has started or not, whether I'm late for class or not, by telling me class hasn't started, therefore you're not late, therefore it's not 5 p.m. already, He's in fact answering my question, but he's answering my question indirectly. That is a flaunt. Okay, in other words, it is a blatant violation that can then be worked out so that you then figure out by reasoning, oh, what he meant to say wasn't at all that it's, you know, class hasn't started yet, but don't worry, you're fine. It's not five yet. Because I, I think that I know why you're asking is that you're worried that you're late for class. And so I'm telling you this fact isn't true. Okay, so that's a flaw. Now, as I said, it's the most interesting uh, form because you get these chain of reasoning that are called implicatures. Okay, and so that's one of the ways that you derive implicatures is through flaws. Okay, the other way is through following the principle of cooperation, okay? So that's the interesting thing, is the principle of cooperation generates implicatures either by following it or by flouting it, okay? Not by violating it, by the way. By, if you violate, 
what you get is something is something different. Um, you know, it's like you, you're going to get implicatures because you're pretending to be cooperative, but the implicatures will be fake. Okay, so for example, let's say, okay, that the two of us, for reasons that we don't know what they are and we don't care what they are, we want her to think that it's already past five. Right? So, so door opens, what time is it? And we say, well, class started a long time ago. Right? That's not true, in fact. Class hasn't started yet. But she doesn't know it, right? And because it's not blatant that it's not true, right? I mean, I mean, it's blatant in the sense that, uh, okay, bad example. And we say it's 5.30, right? Now, she has absolutely no way of knowing that that's not true. Let's assume that there are no watches anywhere else, et cetera, et cetera, right? You have to work with me on this example. Um, then she's going to believe that, um, you know, the class is, uh, is um, you know, already started. Right, and then so so if I just violate what you think is well, he's being truthful, and therefore I draw the conclusion that the start the, the, that it is five thirty p.m. That is a fake conclusion, okay? Because I misled you by lying to you, right? But you don't know that. To you, communication has taken place perfectly fine. And you walk around happy as a clown thinking it's 5 30 p.m. Right? Unbeknownst to you, it's not. So go. Right? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, in my example, yes, you are. You just, <laughs> you just believe me, um, you know. And then again, in the example, I want to lie to you about the time. What's wrong with me in my example? I don't know. But I mean, my point is when you violate, you don't get special implicatures. You get the, the regular implicatures if you haven't violated is the same implicatures. Only they're fake, but you, the, the hearer, don't know that. All right, um, so this is what we mentioned uh, uh, before. Um, okay, so it's another example, but it's a good one. Um, so, um, you know, suppose that you say to me, what were Mary and John doing? And I say, well, Mary and John were in the library, but they were not reading books, okay? Now, what's the assumption that you make that Mary and John were doing in the library? Kissing. Kissing, for example, right? Yes, I mean, um, but interestingly enough, something having to do with sex. Okay, now, what we know about libraries and the fact they're public places and so on, probably rules out much more than kissing, right? But certainly, you didn't think sculpture. That's what they were doing. They were sculpting clay. Right? Because that's not what happens in the library, right? And so, so neither is kissing, by the way. But this is an implicature because it says, well, I'm blatantly violating by telling you the one thing that they weren't doing, mm -hmm. right? I mean, but they also were not cooking pasta or or composing sonnets or you know learning to paraglide or you know playing a football game and so on and so forth, right? They, I mean the the, the set of things that Mary and John were not doing in the library is literally infinite. Okay? So, obviously, I'm violating the maximum um, of relevance, the maximum of quantity, right? Mm -hmm. But then I must mean something else, and, and so they must have been doing something that I don't want to talk about. What is the one thing that we don't talk about in our society? Well, many things, but the salient one, the funny one, is sex, right? Therefore, it must be related to sex. And as we said a minute ago, probably kissing, certainly not much more than kissing. Mm -hmm. You know, if they were having an orgy, that'd be weird, because it'd be like, wow, in the library, yes. <laughs> Crazy. Those librarians, <laughs> don't tell Sarah Norton and that. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so uh, this I also said before, um, you know, you can also get implicatures without flouting when you just are following the, the principle uh, of cooperation. There's an example there, you know, you say to somebody, where's the closest gas station? They say, oh, just, just round the corner. The assumption is that the gas station is open. 
if you went there and you found that the gas station was closed, you would you would have every right to be mad, right? Because you say, well, you know, you you really, I I you know I didn't want to know in general. I wanted to get gas, right? That's why people ask where the gas station is, right? Uh, or yeah, it's around the corner. It's been closed for five years. Right? That doesn't help me, right? So so you assume that, uh, that there is uh, you know this uh, you know that, that the gas station is open is an implicature that you draw from the assumption that the person is being cooperative. Okay. Now here, uh, here at the bottom, you see I have a, I have a note here that's um, a little mysterious because we haven't talked about what those two uh, are yet. And so that's the next thing that we're gonna that we're gonna do. Um, and I've got another slide that talks about uh, about that. So let me find it if I can find it. Here it is. Um, so, so it turns out um, that Grice um, is really sort of using cooperate in two meanings at the same time. Okay, and then that's a little bit confusing. And several people have have um, talked about this, including myself. I wrote an article about this a long time ago. Um, and uh, you know, so so there is a literature that explains this in more detail. If you're interested, I can. I can send you the, 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 the articles. But so the point is this. Um, imagine an example where you are in a train station in, uh, in uh, London, right? And uh, you want to know, you have to go to Glasgow, right? And so you ask somebody, when does the train for Glasgow leave, right? And the person says, 10.30, right? So you're like, all right, okay, good. You know, so that's, that's what I need to know. However, imagine that that day the trains are on strike, right? And so the trains are not running, but the, the timetable says that the train leaves at 10.30, right? So then, then the, 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 the speaker B there, in the first case, is being helpful at the locutionary level, that is at the language level. He's answering your question. But he's not being useful in terms of getting you to achieve the goal for which you asked the question. Okay, that is, you didn't ask when does the train for Glasgow leave, because I am doing a survey on the timetables of the British Railways. However interesting that might be, right? I want to go to Glasgow. That's why I'm asking you that question, right? So in order to be cooperative, you need to be. Co there's cooperation at two separate levels. On the one level, you cooperate in terms of like getting the conversation to keep going, right? Where you, you meet the conversational goals of the speaker. You ask me a question, I give you an answer, right? But at the other level, there is cooperation on your extra linguistic goals, right? The goals that you have that don't have to do with language, where you want to get to Glasgow, right? But, but if the trains are on strike, answering your question is pointless. So a really cooperative answer is to say, forget the train, you really need to get yourself an Uber or, or walk or something, right? Probably not walk, it's a long distance, okay? Rent a car, okay? So, so that's the difference there between the two things, right? So, and, and Grice never really distinguishes between these two levels of cooperation. Whereas many people, as I said, including myself, actually have done so, right? So, so we know that there is cooperation at the linguistic level, and then there is cooperation at, at the extra linguistic level where, where people are trying to achieve goals that don't have particularly to do with language at all, okay? But they have to do with like getting to Glasgow, for example, okay? All right, so, so as I was saying here, the problem here is that when you say, where's the closest gas station, it's just around the corner, you are cooperative, you can be cooperative at two levels. If you are a cartographer who's doing a survey of the location of gas stations, all they need to know is the location. Uh, or if you're going to the gas station to meet a friend, Okay, you don't care whether it's working or not working, whether they're out of gas or not, you know, whether they stopped working five years ago. All you need to know is that the gas station is there, right? But if you're going there to get gas, then it's not helpful, 
right? So, so there's this distinction between the linguistic goal, which is an answer to the question, where is the gas station? And then the extra linguistic goal, which is, why are you going there? Let me help you achieve your goal, regardless of, of whether the gas station is located, because that might not be that relevant to your goal. Okay. Another example. Suppose that uh, you know you see a friend who has a um, bottle of wine in, in, on you know on his desk, and it's open, but he's not touching it. If you say, "Are you going to drink that?" the friend can say, "No, I'm I'm, I'm just leaving it there," you know, I, or can say, "Would you like it?" Right. So in in the first case, he's answering you at the locutionary level. He's saying, you ask me a question, I'm answering the question. No, I'm not gonna drink it. But then the other case is he's saying, if you ask me about an open bottle of wine, I'm assuming that you wanna drink it. So, so I'm offering it to drink to you, or, or I'm gonna say, sorry, no, I'm saving it for a really good food. I like it <laughs> for suck. Okay? And that's the end of a friendship. Don't do that if you value the friendship. All right. So, um, so that's, uh, uh, you know, there is this confusion between, between the two levels of cooperation. Um, now, another thing that I wanted to uh, stress in terms of like, um, uh, you know, getting implicature worked out when there is no flout is the scalar uh, implicatures because, the, the, and these are like super, uh, you know, people talk about them a lot in the literature. Okay, even though they're kind of a little bit of a marginal uh, area, but they've gotten more press than pretty much anything else in, in uh, Gricean uh, pragmatics. So there you have a scale that goes from few to all, right? So you can say, I know I've read a few books. I've read some books, I've read many books, I've read most books, and I've, got, and I've read all the books about something. Right? Then you see that that's a scale, right? Mm -hmm. so, so few means you know, just a couple, maybe three. Some means, I don't know, three, four books, right? Um, you know, if you say, I've read many books about Shakespeare. So how many books would that be? Many books about Shakespeare. What would you say? Many. Yeah, how many? How, what number would that be? 20. 20. Most books about Shakespeare? Oh, hundreds. Mm -hmm. I've read all the books about Shakespeare. That's impossible. But no one could, could do that, you know, because there's too many have been published, right? What's a few books about Shakespeare? Five. Okay. Notice that if I said to you, um, how many uh, pieces of popcorn did you eat? All of it. Oh, no, you didn't, because the seed oh, light, yeah. there, there you go, <laughs> violation of the principle of cooperation. Okay, so no, you didn't eat them all. So, so where would you, where would I, you be on the scale? I ate most of them. Most of them. Because I went back for a second helping. For, for a second helping. Um, how many in number would most be? A hundred? Maybe. Maybe. But not 200, right? No. Right. Whereas for the books of for the Shek books on Shakespeare, 200 is probably low for most. Mm -hmm. It's probably thousands, mm -hmm. right? So you see the difference there. You know, same thing. If you say I have met most of Mary's husbands, what's the number going to be? Probably three. Yeah. Three, four, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Right, because because you, you can't have that many husbands, right? So so you see that the scale the, is influenced that the actual number is influenced by what it is that we're putting on the scale, mm -hmm. okay, on the scalar scale. Now, and here's the interesting thing: um, if you state any level of the scale, it implies the negation of the of the things to the right of it. Okay, so if you say, I have read a few books on Shakespeare, it means that you haven't read most of them, and certainly that you haven't read all of them, mm -hmm. right? If you say, I've read many 
books on Shakespeare, it implies that you haven't read most of them, right? So if, I, if you say to me, um, you know, I've done most of the homework, it implies you haven't done it all, mm -hmm. right? So, so that's the, the, the implicature. And again, this is just uh, uh, achieved by following the principle of cooperation. You don't have to flout, you don't have to violate. It's just by saying something, we draw the implicature that if you're saying this by the principle, by the maximum quantity, you cannot state the higher level of the scale. So if you're stating a level in the middle, that means that you are prevented by the maximum quantity from stating a higher level of the scale, right? So if you say I've met some of Mary's children, you haven't met most of them and you certainly have not met all of them, okay? But you could say I've met some of Mary's children, I've met in fact two, right? I mean, that, that works because two is some, right? For children, if you said, I've had some of the popcorn, I had two kernels, that would be weird because that's a few. Okay, all right. All right, now another point that um, is very important uh, about um, the principle of cooperation is that uh, it is, uh, it assumes, uh, it presupposes rationality, okay? In other words, the subject of the cooperation, the, the speakers that, that engage into, into these exchanges are supposed to be rational subjects, okay? Um, uh, and, um, you, know, you know, and this, for example, means that if you say something in front of an audience, you're claiming responsibility for having said that, okay? That is, you're responsible for what you say and for what you do, okay, in front of society. Um, now, this is uh, unusual because, uh, because most people uh, consider Grice to be abstract, you know, so not to take into account things like rationality and, and so on. But actually, he says um, this very, very clearly. Um, and, you know, this, this is just a bunch of other people that have also made the same claim of rationality. Um, you know, so... Let's briefly um, define um, what rationality means, okay, in this particular uh, case. Because again, as I said, some people have a kind of a weird understanding of, of what rationality means. Um, and it's not a topic that we think about a lot most of the time, okay? That is, most people just don't think about it. They just assume that people are, are rational. So what does it mean to be rational? What it means is that it's actually very simple. It means that you make choices based on weighing pros and cons, okay? And that you are able to identify the least expensive solution for the maximum result. That's rationality, okay? Now, you may say, okay, that's weird, but think about it this way. Let's say that you want to buy a donut, okay? What's the best way to buy a donut? Well, you want to eat a donut. Sorry, okay, I just screwed up my own example. <laughs> you want to eat a donut. What's the best way to go about if you want to eat a donut? What would you do? Go to the donut store, buy one. Go to the donut store and buy one, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, now let's say that you can't, okay? Because of whatever reason, right? That, that avenue is blocked. How else could you go about eating a donut? Turn on the fryer and make your own. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, why didn't you give me that option before? Because it was open to, to you, but you chose instead to go to the store. It's easier. There you go. Right? So in other words, you were a rational agent and you weighed two possible plans. One, go to the store, buy one, cost a dollar, right, 50, mm -hmm. 70 cents, something like that, depending on the kind of donut. And here in commerce, you know, it's like between 75 and a dollar, right. Um, so pretty low cost, you know, going to the store, 
almost free, basically, right? And not, not a major investment in time and energy. Now, on the other hand, making your own donut, well, you gotta buy the ingredients, et cetera, et cetera. So that's not that straightforward, but let's assume you have a well-stocked pantry. Um, and so you have all the ingredients at home, right? But you still need to heat up the, the oil. That's gonna take, you know, half an hour minimum or you know at least 20 minutes because a large amount of, of that's oil. assuming that you even know how to make the donuts oh, point will take yes to google a recipe <laughs> point will take yes you, you probably need to google the recipe and so that that will make it very difficult but assume that you know how to do it uh, right so you will need to have a large quantity of, of heated oil and sugar and flour and then all these things right uh yeast you know all, all these things and it's going to take a very long time because you're going to have to use your yeast and let it uh, rise and you know whatever. So so we're talking hours and hours and a lot of labor, right? To eat one donut, that's really silly, right? Therefore, you said correctly, I'm going to pick the option of going to the store and buying a donut rather than making my own donuts, right? And now notice that there's even more improbable plans to eat a donut. Okay, another strategy would be to go sit outside the donut shop and beg, right? Any person that comes out of the donut shop, you say, please, can I have a donut? I really want to eat a donut. I bet you that eventually somebody will give you a donut, okay? But you made a face when I, when I started saying this hypothesis, right? Why did you make a face? Because that would just be... Morally repugnant, right? Yeah. Yes, because our society frowns on requesting strangers to give you donuts. Why? I can never understand. <laughs> but you know. no, because of course in our society you're supposed to be self-reliant. If you want a donut, you buy it for yourself, right? If you cannot buy it, you don't need it, right? So, so that plan might work because, as I said, eventually there will be somebody who will be like, "Yeah, hey, sure, okay, I got twelve. I'll give you one. I won't even notice, right?" But if he's human rating. It's frowned upon by society. You might get, uh, you know, chased away by the owner of the shop that doesn't want his clients or her clients harassed. And you're also it's possible that unless you find somebody who's like generous uh, with their donors, then you may not get the donor. So it's not a very good plan. You could also walk into the donor shop, hold them up, and uh, steal the donor. Right? You put the gun in front of the donor, say. I, do you feel lucky, punk? And you grab the donut and run out, right? There's a drawback with this plan. The donut shop has been a hard day, <laughs> yes. And donut shops are, are frequented by police, right? Who frown on people <laughs> holding up their donut shops at gunpoint or anybody else's donut shop at gunpoint for that matter. And so most likely you're going to end up in jail or even dead, right? Which is very expensive because then the lawyer is going to cost thousands and thousands of dollars to get you out of the of jail, and you could have bought a ton of donuts with that kind of money, right? So you see that that these plans are getting um, another option is you go, you find a donut shop that that uh, the daughter of the son of the donut shop is good looking, you marry them, and now the donut shop, you know, after the owner dies, it's your donut shop. You go in and you ate all the donuts that you want. But again, it's not a very straightforward way of getting your donut, right? And you may, you know, have to wait 20 years before you get the donut. Lots of time, effort, and then you're married to a stupid um, the son of the donut uh, shop owner, you know, and so that's not good, right? Then you get diabetes. You get diabetes, and if you're already <laughs> married, you become bigamous, and then, you know, then you end up in jail. So again, not a good strategy, okay? Okay, so long story short, you said exactly the right thing because you picked the most efficient, the least costly and best result plan. That is rationality. Okay? So in other words, yours was a rational choice, right? And Grice says the speaker is a rational agent that makes rational choices like this, okay? So that's a crucial point that you will see will then be used in the politeness theory all over the place, okay? Is that the choices that the speakers make are rational in the sense that we just discussed. 
And it's okay. also, I think, relevant to individuals, too, because this is a true story. The mm-hmm. last time I went to go get a donut, I saw someone get ran over by an 18-wheeler. All right. So now that kind of ran donuts for me. I have not been to the store to get another donut, so I might choose to fire up the fryer and absolutely, and that would be rational for to me. You. Absolutely, exactly. That's and that is actually a very, a very, very uh, good point because rationality is always relative to a culture, to an individual, right? So, so by looking from the outside, you can never know whether somebody is rational or irrational, right? Because even the stranger's behavior may make sense. Okay, so imagine you see somebody walking down the, the street, right? And at some point they start jumping and then they keep walking again normally. You're like, well, that's irrational behavior, right? Why would you do that? But assume that this person really believes that if you step on a crack, it's gonna you know, break the back of your mother or relative or whatever, whatever it is, right? Then that's rational behavior. Right. If you really believe that uh, if a black cat crosses your path, you're going to have bad luck. It's rational behavior to change your path to to avoid crossing the black cat. Right. Mm -hmm. And again, to me, that's cray cray. Right. (laughs) But to that person, if they're really superstitious, if they really think that that's the thing, that's what it is. Right. Mm -hmm. How many how many people buy lottery tickets? Have you ever bought a lottery ticket? Have you bought lottery tickets? You have not. Um, I'm sure the students uh, at home have bought uh, lottery tickets. You are more likely to be hit by lightning than to win lottery, right? Therefore, it's irrational to buy a lottery ticket, right? To me, to you, it's perfectly <laughs> rational because you say quite logically, if you don't buy a ticket at all, you never win the lottery. You have a greater chance than me to, to win the lottery. Right? I say, well, overall, it's impossible. You say, well, it's less impossible if you don't buy if you buy one than if you don't buy one at all. So you see, it's rational to you, it's rational to you, it's rational to me, because we have different views on what is important in this case. Okay. So so very good point, very, very, very well taken. Um, you know, that is rationality is always relative to a set of beliefs. It can be a culture, can be the belief of the individual, their experiences, uh, etc. Right? If you hate the owner of the donut shop, the one donut shop in, in the village, you say, "Screw it! I'm 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 cooking my own donuts." Right? And 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 everybody will be like, oh, "Of course she is." Right? Yeah, you know, because because you know we all know how you hate the owner of the donut shop. Right? All right. Um, Couple more things. Uh, so this we saw criticism of rice. Where is it? There it is. Um, all right. So so I'm wrapping things up. Um, so as I said, you know, rice has been super successful, extremely important. Everybody uh, agrees that it's like really really important um, uh, thing. But people have criticized uh, his his views on a number of. Um, uh, reason the one that uh, that's come up several times is that basically Grice really sort of ignores the, the power differential that there might be in a, in a conversation uh, in a situation. And remember, I said that this a contextual claim that people say, "Well, Grice doesn't care about the context, doesn't care about the situation." Uh, I mean, to some extent, it's true. Um, because I mean, he was a philosopher. He wasn't interested in you know social linguistics, right? You know, he, he was interested in philosophy. Um, you know, but then again, it's easy to sort of put it back in. You know, so for example, if I am um, you know a, a worker in a factory and I think that I'm being exploited by uh, uh, by the owner of the factory who's not paying me enough. I may, you know, sabotage one of the machines in the factory, and it's a perfectly rational thing to do. From the standpoint of the owner of the factory, it's crazy. Because now the machine is broken, I, I'm no longer producing widgets or whatever it is that I was producing, therefore I'm gonna fire the, 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 the workers and you're out of a job, right? Yeah, but I felt I was being exploited, 
Okay, so, so, you know, there's a power differential there. I cannot go to you and say, hey, I think you should pay me more, right? Because then you'll fire me, right? So therefore what I do is I do this other thing where I shift the power differential in a different direction, right? So, so as I said, you can uh, incorporate uh, uh, issues of power and social uh, relations. So for example, you know, if I say it's hot in here, right? If you're like a student, you say, well, yeah, it's pretty hot in here. But let's say that you were my butler, right? Well, then it's hot in here is an order. You go and open the window. Good luck here, we don't have <laughs> our windows don't open. Okay, so, but okay, but assume that we are in downtown Ali and the, ah, no, Ali, yes. Um, all right, so, so, um, uh, so that's, that's another thing. But again, it's easy to fix that. You know, all you need to do is, is make, incorporate social considerations into the reasoning that the, that the, the subjects uh, do. Now, there's a, a different claim was that uh, the principle of cooperation was not psychologically realistic, okay? Now, this one is, is um, a bit more complicated to explain, but, but in a nutshell, and without getting into the technical uh, stuff, so, some psycholinguists said, let's take Grice's ideas and let's derive a, a prediction on processing time, okay? And so they said, if you have a statement that's just little, right? So if I say the popcorn is salty, right? It's gonna take you X amount of time to process it because you have to process these words in your head, right? Now, if I then imply something through an implicature, saying the popcorn is salty, therefore you shouldn't eat it, because I know that you have high blood pressure, therefore if I tell you the popcorn is salty, that means don't eat the popcorn because it's bad for you, okay? See, medical advice too. This, this class is just like you're learning all the time. Um, so then they said, whatever time it took you to process the popcorn is salty, you're gonna to have to process a little bit more for the implicature, don't eat it because you have high, high uh, uh, blood pressure, right? So then the standard pragmatic model was the psycholinguist operationalizing Grice. Grice never said anything about processing time. He's a philosopher, could care less about processing time, right? But the psycholinguist said, we expect an implicature to take longer to process than just the literal meaning of a statement, right? So then they went and measured it and they found, much to everybody's uh, surprise, that some implicatures were processed faster than the literal statement, right? So they said, Grice is wrong, right? And they came up with this idea of direct access. The idea being that if you have, for example, an irony and uh, you know, you're in a situation where somebody just you know, did something bad to you and you say, you're a fine friend, meaning you're not a good friend, right? Um, you directly access the negative meaning, you're not a good friend without passing by the literal meaning, you're a fine friend first, okay? So you directly understand the negative meaning and then eventually you may go back and process the, the literal meaning, but that's not the first thing that you do, okay? Um, then there was a different approach, there is a different approach uh, that says, no, no, it's got nothing to do with literal meaning and implicature, it's about saliency. You will process first the meaning that's the most salient, the most obvious in terms of the situation. So if the situation primes you to process the friendly meeting, you will process that one. If the situation primes you to process the other meeting, the, the not good friend, you will process that one first. So it's about saliency, it's not about literal versus non-literal, okay? Um, the, the discussion is still ongoing and um, you know we're not gonna get into it, but, but this was a discussion there. Of more interesting uh, to, to our um, goals here, is the, the claim that um, the principle of cooperation lacks cross-cultural validity, 
Okay. In other words, the idea being that Grice has formulated a principle that works very well for English, but that doesn't work in other languages, in other cultures. Okay. And this was claimed, for example, in a famous uh, paper that many, many people have quoted by Eleanor Ork Ox Keenan about the Malagasy. The Malagasy are a tribe that lives in Madagascar, uh, the little island of uh, uh, Africa. And so they, they have their own culture, their own language. And uh, in this culture, if you ask a question like, when, you know, like, what's the name of this kid? Uh, they tell you, oh, child, you know, or, you know, little boy. They don't tell you Bob. I mean, that's a little bit name, but I think, I mean, they don't give you the first name of their child, right? Why? Because information is valuable and you don't want to waste it on, on, on anybody, on a, on a random person that asks you for something. So then, then uh, Ox Keenan says there, there, that's proof that Grice is wrong, okay? Because, because this culture doesn't provide enough information. It just provides whatever information they feel like, okay? Now, at, at first brush, it looks quite uh, a damaging uh, criticism uh, of Grice, except it's not, okay? And here, here's why. In our culture, not all information is freely available. You know, if I say, what's your name? You, you answer my question, right? No problem, right? If I say, do you own a house? Okay. What's your mortgage? You see, she laughed, right? If you, if you cannot see. Why? Because that's not freely available information, right? It's in fact extremely rude to ask somebody a direct question like that. Okay, I get to do it only because I'm the professor, so I can do this, <laughs> right? But but uh, but if I actually pursued it for real, that'd be stepping uh, across the line, right? So there is information like that that is not freely available. Okay, for example, uh, if you go to the bank manager, your bank manager, don't do that, by the way. Okay, don't try this at home. <laughs> if you go to your bank manager and says, "So, when is the deposit, the money, the the truck with the money coming in tomorrow?" <laughs> Guess what? They're not gonna give you the answer. In fact, guess what? They're gonna call the police. You know? The State Department doesn't reveal when uh, high-ranking officials travel to uh, Afghanistan or Baghdad, whatever, right? Why? That's valuable information, mm -hmm. right? So we give out freely, as Grice predicts, only the information that's considered free goods, right? But if the information is too valuable, we don't give it out at all, okay? Much like the Malagasy, right? Except that the Malagasy have a threshold of the value of information that's much lower than ours, right? Where you're like, oh, I'm not gonna tell you the, the name of my son because why should you know? What's it to you? And like you saying, my mortgage, what's it to you, right? You know, it's the same principle, except the threshold is in a different position. Right? So, in fact, it turns out Eleanor uh, Oxkinen hasn't proven anything about, uh, about Christ. It's just that different cultures set the threshold of what is valuable information differently. Okay? But, as I said, people have criticized Grice for these reasons, and um, uh, also in a completely different direction, saying, yeah, kind of we agree with the idea of the principle of cooperation, but we can improve it. Okay, so, so you can do this in two different directions. One is adding maxims, and the other one is taking away maxims, subtracting maxims, right? So among people who have added maxims is John Searle, who added the maximum of idiomaticity to, to the uh, manner. Um, you know, this way to speak idiomatically. If, you, if, if there is an idiomatic way of saying something, use that way, not another one, right? So if there is the word die, why would you say cause to become not alive? Right? There has to be a reason to not speak it idiomatically, right? If I say, um, John hit the ball with his foot with great effort, was it a good kick? Probably not, right? Otherwise I would have said John kicked the ball, 
mm -hmm. right? If I say, Mary produced a series of sounds that closely match the score of a song. Is it a good singing? Probably not, mm -hmm. right? Because otherwise <laughs> I would have said she sang the song, right? So, so that's the hypnoticity thing. Uh, Leach has uh, a uh, maxim of um, politeness. Uh, I actually introduce a maximum of appropriateness. We don't need to go into why that was uh, uh, the case. Uh, Davidson, who's a philosopher, um, has a, uh, a principle of charity, which basically says assume that the other speaker makes sense, uh, you know, and then try to maximize agreement between you and the other speaker. Um, and then on the other side, completely different approach is the opposite approach, which is to try to reduce the number of maxims, okay? And here there's been um, um, Levinson, who says, let's take it down to three maxims. Uh, Larry Horn, who said, let's take it down to two maxims. And then of course, the winners of the game, the relevance theory people who say one maxim is enough, the principle of relevance, we, all, we, all need, we only need relevance. Everything else is unnecessary, okay? Um, I have my doubts about, uh, about that one, but that's their, their claim. Now, notice one thing, that the idea of having the fewer number of maxims is better from the standpoint of um, uh, theory, okay? Because you want your theory to be as simple as possible. That's what Occam's razor says, right? You know, is make things, uh, you know, you, all you need, only what you need, no more. Right, um, and and so theoretically, Occam's razor is super important. Right, so if you can explain everything with three maxims rather than four, then your theory is better. So in principle, having only one maxim is the best. In principle, okay. Right. So so then um, we don't have time to look at uh, all of them, but we'll look very briefly about relevance theory, and then that's it. Now, relevance theory has been very successful. And it is, in, in some ways, the winner of the pragmatics war over, over Grice, okay? That is, they, they are the, the theory of, uh, of pragmatics that's had the most success. Was presented in the 1986 uh, book. And basically, the big assumption, the main point is that when you communicate something, you also communicate at the same time the assumption, the presumption of the optimal relevance of whatever it is that you communicate. Okay, so in other words, by saying something, you're also saying at the same time, and by the way, what I just told you is optimally relevant. Okay, what does optimally relevant mean? You have it there, it's the two conditions. A, it's relevant because the contextual effect are large. In other words, it gives you a lot of information or the information is super important. And the effort that you needed to expand to, to acquire that information is small, okay? So suppose that uh, you see, we're, we're in the street, we're walking down the street, right? And you see a car that's about to hit us. What would you say? Watch out, right? It's very short, two words, two syllables, right? That's as short as it gets, hey would be, but then hey can mean all sorts of things, whereas what child says, danger, right? And it's maximally relevant. Losing your life seems like super important thing to know, right? You're about to die, that's, you know, yeah, I'd like to know. In case, by the way, you know, if you know that I'm about to die, yeah, let me know, right? So it meets the optimal relevance criteria. It required very little effort to acquire, two syllables, that's, that's very little. And it's maximally relevant. I'm about to be hit by a car, so I should know it and move out of the way, right? So that is a, um, a good example of how the maximum relevance works. Now, if you wanna be picky and if you read the, the chapter, I show how this reintroduces duality inside the, 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 the maximum, the principle of relevance. So it's not really one it's at least two principles going, but let's not get picky. Um, and I don't want to 
irritate the relevance theory people. Some of my best friends are relevance theorists. Mm. Uh, the one last thing that I want to say about relevance theory is that because of this uh, uh, definition, it introduces the idea that there's weak and strong inferences. Right? So in other words, that implication is a matter of degree. So if you state something, you strongly implicate that you believe that, right? So if I say, there's a car about to hit you, it means I strongly believe that to be true. But then I can also say, you know, I saw Mary and John in the library and they were not reading books. I weakly imply that they were having sex or doing something sexual. Right? And then I may be hinting at something, and that is going to be a very, very weak implication. Right? So the idea being that there is a um, continuum of strength of implication from the strongest thing, which is an, an overt statement, to the weakest thing, which is like, like a vague hint uh, that something is, is the case. Right? All right, so that uh, concludes, um, concludes our discussion of um, uh, the principle of cooperation, crisis contribution. Uh, to, to pragmatics. So in a nutshell, what do we need to remember about this? The principle of cooperation basically contribute to the conversation in the direction that the conversation says. Um, four maxims, right? Um, the fact that cooperation can be both um, uh, linguistic and extra linguistic. Um, the fact that the principle of cooperation can generate implicatures through being followed and through being violated blatantly through a flout, therefore. Um, scalar implicatures, right, which is when you're following the principle of cooperation, but there is a, a scale there. And then, you know, that that is being criticized, but the criticisms haven't really damaged it too much because you know you can basically work your way out of them and that then people have sought to improve it in one way or another um you know with more or less success and now there is like um relevance theory that claims to be post gricean in other words we've put rice behind us and we're moving forward and then instead all the other people that added maxims etc they would describe their work as neo gricean that is where we're still following crisis crisis idea we're just improving that okay so and that's where the field is at okay this, this is uh, and by the way just in case you're curious i do work in neo gricean pragmatics that's my thing okay all right so this concludes the lecture if you have questions uh, from the, those of you at home shoot an email um, and uh, we will answer it next week or I will answer you in the, 